So I'll just give you a little bit of background on Chris. I've known Chris, we were just talking sure, for a very long time, since I was even a graduate student. And I, uh, he uh, completed his uh, PhD with Mike Sorensen at Boston and then did a postdoc with Scott Edwards at Harvard and then went to University of Illinois. And I asked both Mike and Scott if they could, you know, give me something real juicy on Chris. And uh, all they told me was, you know, the saying that what happens in the field stays in the field. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, I'm very curious, but I don't, I don't know anymore. And more, I more likely have dirt on them than me. Yeah, well, I think, you know, it often happens that way. Um, and so uh, a fun fact for Chris, I didn't know this, but uh, apparently he's the founder of Nerd Night, which has three events in the vicinity of San Francisco. So... Uh, something more, more national. Um, but on a more background with, with uh, some science that Chris has done, I'm really thrilled that he could come. He's really been one of those, you know, when I think about bird genomics, you know, we often think of people who have really big labs, but if you often go and look at the papers, Chris has been really instrumental in some of our early understanding of how MHC worked in birds was work that he did. Some of the early transcriptome work that was done in birds was work that Chris did, you know, actually was there at the bench doing the actual work. And then just in the last year, he's had two absolutely beautiful papers that came out. One, which he's going to talk about today, um, related to sort of four sexes in a bird and the evolution of, of one of these chromosomal inversions. But he's also done some really fascinating work on how gene regulation operates in bird speciation. So a lot of these are subjects that have been done uh, to some extent in other taxa, but haven't really been tackled in birds. And I really think of Chris, even though he's just an assistant professor and, and just filed for tenure, it's really being at the real forefront of some of the work that's happening in bird genomics. So it's a real pleasure to have you here, and thank you for taking the time to come. Thanks, Rory. Thanks, Thanks everybody. For coming. So it is a real pleasure to be here. As I've been saying, this is my first time uh, here on the campus at Berkeley, and it's, it's, it's really exciting. Um, yeah, so Nerd Night, uh, if you haven't been, you should. Uh, it has become sort of my uh, greatest success story, despite all the science <laughs> stuff. I'm way more famous for Nerd Night than... Uh, how many of you have been? Have any of you been? Yeah, there's a few. Uh, there's a few. So you should go give talks. It's a good place for your outreach. Um, I, I use it in any in any and every NSF uh, application that I've been <laughs> And it's just a lot, it's just a lot of fun. Um, so go. It's not all biology, it's all, all branches of nerdery. Um, so uh, I actually came up with a broader title because I didn't just want to talk about those the weird sparrows. Uh, I will spend most of the talk talking about the birds of four, four sexes, but I also have this other title, because I kind of want to give you an uh, overview of the things um, we're doing in the lab. Uh, so it has been uh, a really exciting couple of years for uh, bird genomics. There's been sort of this explosion of sequencing. Birds have these little tiny genomes that are uh, relatively easy to uh, assemble. And so now, um, for once, birds seem to be leading the charge um, in some aspect of molecular biology that is uh, genome sequencing. And so a lot of the effort has gone into broadly sampling birds. Um, but where my interests fall really um, is in this group of birds, uh, the, the passerines, which actually make up uh, half of bird diversity, plus or minus. And so uh, the approach that we mostly take in my lab is to look at recent, recent, divergence, recent divergences in birds to get at the mechanisms of adaptation. And as evolutionary biologists, I think that's probably what a lot of us do. But as I sort of think about themes in my lab, um, one of the developing themes, if you can really call this a theme, is that I really like to study the weirdest um, birds that there are. And I'll try to point out some examples of uh, how the oddities of the natural world can inform general principles of evolution. But I have this sort of uh, uh, schizophrenia where I like to also balance it back and forth because I get frustrated by field work and I want to have a tractable model system so we can do some um, more mechanistic studies. So the species I'm going to talk about today and the subjects I'm going to talk about today kind of span this continuum from really weird wild birds to really practical, uh, sometimes boring seeming birds like uh, uh, the zebrafish. And these, these, this continuum, I think, is kind of uh, illustrative in some ways. I, find, I feel like in the field with these weird birds, we have really nice 
phenotypes that we might be interested in, like these birds with four sexes. I'll tell you more about that. Brood parasitic birds that I've been studying since graduate school. You know, we have birds that have totally lost parental care, pair, parental care, and we can compare them to the rest of birds that have some kind of parental care. Um, so in the field, we have, you know, some of these species that have nice phenotypes to go after. And but our lab, on the, our lab model, on the other hand, we've started to know something about genetic variation, but people haven't really studied. Uh, phenotypic variation to that same extent in zebra finches. So we're starting to go after phenotypes in this lab model system, looking at population variation in song behavior, immune function, and traits like that. So I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to spend most of the talk uh, talking about this bird, the white-throated sparrow, the, the weirdest of the birds that I study, and I'll to explain to you now why uh, maybe this bird is kind of weird. And then for the last maybe a uh, third of the talk or something, I'll provide kind of an overview of the other things we're doing in the lab. So feel free to interrupt me if you do. I might not talk, talk about those two things, but we'll, we'll see how we do. <laughs> um, so why, so you look at this bird and I know it screams out to you. They're so weird. Uh, <laughs> uh, Maybe not. Uh, and so the, they're sparrows. They kind of look like sparrows. But you might notice that you might notice that there's this little difference. There's a tan stripe morph and a white stripe morph, and they differ in this little crown stripe. I know it's yours. Now you're really blown away. So there's two morphs in this in this in this species. And um, what's interesting though is that these morphs are found in both sexes. So there are tan stripe males and females, white stripe uh, males and females. Uh, and this polymorphism is main, has been maintained in uh, the species uh, apparently over long periods of time. Uh, these morphs have been known about for long periods of time. Um, and what's maybe a little bit more interesting is actually at a coarse scale that the genetic basis of this, this, uh, these two morphs have, has also been known for a long time. So uh, tan morph birds have, as in a typical bird, two, two chromosome twos that look kind of the same. White morph birds actually carry two alternative morphologies of uh, chromosome 2 that are separated by a large inversion. So white morph birds are almost heterozygous for these two different versions of chromosome 2. And so right away, the fact that white morph birds are always heterozygous and tan morph birds are basically almost homozygous should start to remind you a little bit of sex chromosomes. Uh, Maybe where this starts to get even more interesting is when you move beyond just the, the plumage color. So these morphs also differ in other aspects of um, particularly um, social behavior. So these white morphs can be thought of being as these um, <coughs> hyper-aggressive type things, white morphs being the most aggressive, um, white morph males that is. Uh, they differ in the amount of parental care they give um, with White morph birds generally being low, relatively low in parental care. They, they vary in the, how they frequently they sing. This is probably the one that's most interesting to me. Um, and a lot of birds, you may know that a lot of songbirds, females don't really sing um, that much or at all. Uh, in these birds, we kind of have uh, almost a continuum where the white morph males are the most singy kind of birds, um, but white morph females and Tan morph males are kind of intermediate, like the kind of okay singers, and then the, 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 the tan morph females barely sing at all. So song behavior varies among morphs and among sexes. And probably the most uh, weird thing about these birds is really how this polymorphism is maintained, and that is by disassortative mating. That is, white morph males basically always mate with tan morph females, and tan morph males basically always mate with white morph females. Yeah, it's weird. And so if you have a, 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 a male bird that's heterozygous for this, uh, chrom these two alternative chromos chromosome versions, uh, you can predict what will happen in the offspring if they mate with females that are homozygous. Um, and basically what you see in the population is 50% um, tan morph birds and 50% white morph birds. Occasionally you get um, matings, of, of homotypic matings, white with white, and that has interesting consequences. One of which we'll talk about is you get these rare homozygotes um, for two chromo uh, chromosome version 2M. Um, 
which I'll explain why that's um, interesting a little bit later. So situations like this where you have a whole set of traits that are encoded by um, genes linked together on a chromosome have gained the catchy moniker of supergenes, and these have now been described in a, in a whole variety of systems. Uh, perhaps most recently in these roughs where you have three different uh, male morphs uh, that are also, these are uh, three different male morphs that are also maintained these as alternative reproductive behaviors in this species, also controlled by an inversion. Uh, there are some trends that are uh, coming out from these studies of supergenes, uh, and one of them is the mechanism that links these genes together, and that is um, inversions in the genome are proving to be important. And the second trend, perhaps, is that uh, hybridization is important. So these, these supergene alleles are moving around across species via hybridization. And so the nice kind of thing about this is that even though supergenes are kind of weird, as you say, these are also trends that I think we're seeing in the speciation literature more broadly both that hybridization is an important process and that inversions um, in particular may be important in allowing adaptive divergence, for example, in the face of gene flow due to uh, reduced recombination or suppressed recombination um, among alternative alleles um, that differ in these inversions. So with respect to the white-throated sparrow, uh, going into this, you know, as I said, we knew a lot of that um, background biology, but we really wanted to know about the history of the inversion, the evolutionary forces at play, uh, specifically the consequences of this reduced recombination on uh, chromosome 2M, and lastly, of course, uh, the holy grail, if you will, um, what, are, what genes uh, are related to the traits of interest that differ among morphs. And so this, uh, this project started and is a collaboration between myself um, and a number of other people, most notably Elena Tuttle, who sadly uh, passed away this uh, past year. But Elena has been uh, studying these birds in the field for uh, over 25 years, really documenting a lot of these behaviors that I, that I talked about. So Elena recruited me to sort of help um, do some of this evolutionary genetic type work. And then I rapidly became overwhelmed, and I recruited an even better population geneticist than me, this guy, uh, Alan Berglund, to also. Uh, so Alan um, and Elena contributed uh, heavily um, to, this, to this, this project. So as with uh, a lot of things, uh, a lot of my work, what we started with doing is you know, sequencing and assembling the genome. And I'm happy to say we did a perfectly like average job. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a this is a this is a figure from a, the a canary genome paper where they compared a bunch of genomes based on contiguity. You know, you have some of the model systems, zebra finch and chicken, kind of in the middle. They also put theirs in the middle, um, and some of the more fragmented genomes here on the outside. If you see a lot of little tiny bars of varying color, that means it's a very fragmented genome. If you see big blocks of the same color, that means it's a relatively good genome. And this is our genome right there. So pretty happy with how it turned out for my first attempt. Um, but really, to get at the evolutionary processes, we wanted to look at genetic variation, um, particularly on chromosome 2. And we took um, the most inexpensive approach that um, I could think of at the time, which is a, uh, called PoolSeq, where you uh, extract DNA from your populations of interest and combine them into pools. So we made a pool of white morph DNA and a pool of tan morph DNA, and we sequenced those genomes, one pool each on an Illumina sequencer. Uh, on average, each individual within that pool is sequenced to 1x, so the pool as a whole is sequenced to about 25x, because we put 25 bird DNAs in each pool. So I know there's a lot of people who do all this stuff all the time, but hopefully there are some people who don't do all this stuff all the time, so I'm doing some background that's not too boring. But basically, this is what that looks like. If you look at a pool of reads, um, this is a site that varies um, between a C and a T. Um, and say half of these read, these are all these gray bars are reads, 
half of these reads contain a C, the other ones represent the alternative allele, which is a T, so you can um, estimate the allele frequency from that at, say, 50%, and you can do this from each population, and if you can estimate the allele frequencies from each population, then you can uh, estimate all kinds of statistics about diversity, and, and, um, and, and also you can estimate a handy statistic, like uh, FST, to look at um, the differences in allele frequencies um, between populations. So if we do that, um, this is what we see. So this is a histogram of uh, FST across the genome, and right away this is um, kind of weird because we see this bimodal distribution of FST. So most of the genome looks like this, which is what you might expect for looking at FST within a species, within individuals caught at the same field site. Uh, FST is uh, low, but there's this block of stuff that is relatively high divergence. Um, and so based on this pattern, we kind of assumed or predicted that this high divergence part of the genome corresponded to the uh, inversion. Uh, we confirm this by actually physically mapping back clones onto chromosomes uh, and confirming that these high divergence areas are in fact associated with the inversion. So now that we know which of our SNPs are associated with the inversion and how they're ordered, we can kind of slide along the chromosome and look at what FST looks like. And so as we're sliding along, what you can see is outside of the inversion, we have this uh, low divergence as you'd expect, and then within the inversion we have um, high FST. This is, in fact, as high as FST can be, given that the white morph birds are heterozygous for the two alternatives. So within this block of high divergence, we can find that the super gene contains over a thousand genes. So it's a lot of genes. Um, you can see how then it might be problematic to figure out which gene does what, but um, I'll come back to that. And there's about a million differences um, fixed between the two alternatives. Uh, we can take our genome and try to put it to look at that uh, in a phylogenetic context, context. And so up here we have our target species, white-throated sparrow. Here we're just looking at the region outside of the inversion. Uh, we sequence whole genome of it's what turns out to be a sister species, Harris sparrow, uh, golden crown sparrow. And then we had already collected transcriptome data um, from some of these outgroups. And so we, we kind of made this hodgepodge data set of whole genome sequencing and transcriptome sequencing and built a, a tree like this. Uh, it gets interesting when you look within the inversion. Of course, within the inversion, white-throated sparrow is going to be represented by two divergent alleles. And it turns out they're really quite divergent because they're not um, sister to each other. So the, the origin of this inversion predates the radiation of most of the genus, you know, Harris sparrow, golden crown sparrow, white crown sparrow. This is the other zonotrichia. So it's after the origin of the zonotrichia genus, but before the radiation of the rest of the um, genus. So these two chromosomes are highly divergent. So what we think most likely happened is that <coughs> These two uh, alternative chromosome alleles have been introduced into white-throated sparrow via a hybridization. But we can't really prove that because there's no other species that's currently extant that carries this allele. So our working hypothesis is that the species that did carry that, this 2M allele, is now extinct. So I described that these uh, two chromosomes uh, don't recombine. Um, because, they're all, because we always have, um, you very rarely see homozygotes for the, two, uh, for the two M allele. So what you might expect based on that is just like in W or uh, more famously Y chromosomes, you might see signatures of degeneration due to uh, inefficient uh, selection on this non-recombining chromosome. And so we wanted to test if this was the case. So for those of you who don't study uh, sex chromosomes as a, as a living, you may, have heard, you may still have heard about this idea that Y chromosomes are going extinct and, and men will be extinct. And so that's sort of the extreme possible you know, sort of scenario that we could see here. Is, um, uh, that turns out not to be true in case you're this is In case we're worried. In case you're worried. Uh, so we looked at this a couple of ways. Uh, uh, one prediction that we made is that we might see a excess polymorphism, uh, excess 
of non-synonymous polymorphism on uh, chromosome 2M uh, as a result of inefficient purifying selection, and in fact, that's what we see. So this is a statistic called the direction of selection, and um, these are, and that's what this shows, is that um, we have this excess maintenance of non-synonymous polymorphism on 2M. We also looked at expression, and we found that uh, uh, genes on the white chromosome tend to be uh, underexpressed relative to the, their tan counterparts. And if you look at allelic expression in white birds, again, white morph birds carry both copies of uh, both alternative alleles, one for 2M and one for 2. And we find that the 2M allele, uh, the white allele, tends to be underexpressed relative to the 2 allele in heterozygotes. And so taken together, uh, again, we think this is evidence of inefficient purifying selection on 2M. So I mentioned that we do rarely see these homozygous 2M, two, uh, these pairings between white birds. And therefore, we should occasionally see uh, individuals that are homozygous for these two M alleles. This is incredibly rare. So over 25 years of field work, uh, Elena has only found um, really three of these birds. Um, and so this is a histogram of body size in day three uh, male white-throated sparrows. These homozygous 2 M, 2 M birds are uh, called super whites. Um, and this is this is the n of one of our uh, of our uh, homozygote two m bird. So it's the smallest, basically the smallest day three male that she ever found. So they're n of one science, but um, there you have it. The females, on the other hand, there's been um, she's found a couple, and there's been one published paper actually, all, also n of one science describing um, the female super white, um, and they actually don't seem to to fit. This pattern. The one described super white female was an adult bird. It was, seemed to be fine, but it was this super aggressive um, uh, uh, female bird. Um, and so, well, one hypothesis we might make is that this this allelic combination is particularly uh, deleterious in male birds. Although, being um, uh, the, it's, you know, we don't know whether that um, super white female also had other um, deleterious um, consequences. So what about identifying um, traits associated with, um, genes associated with traits? And I like to show this example of uh, this, this really great work from Mike Shapiro and his group um, on pigeons. There's been a series of papers on this. And this is what this looks like in your ideal situation where you compare a bunch of pigeons, crested and uncrested pigeons, and you get this beautiful FST outlier um, that explains crestedness. But of course, in our data, we don't have that. We have this blob of high divergence. And so, you know, as cool as this system is, and this gets back to um, some of the challenges of working in this weird birds, this inversion uh, leads to this divergence across basically the whole chromosome and those thousand genes. And so identifying localized signatures of selection is so far, at least with this pooled data set, um, has, has, been, um, has been challenging. But we do have a lot of cool genes that are captured within this inversion. And so maybe, it, maybe it's even silly for us to be thinking about like what the gene for these traits is. These are a set of relatively complex traits. Um, and maybe it's better just focus on maybe this really is a super gene. So we have a number of hormone receptors like estrogen receptor 1, uh, serotonin receptors, um, um, and a number of genes that are interesting and in, with known roles in um, uh, social behavior as well as the bottom two there that have uh, associations with pigmentation. And what's depicted here are just the number of differences in different um, categories, exons, introns, UTRs, um, uh, and non-synonymous versus synonymous sites. So there's a lot of, these genes are highly divergent um, depending on where you look. Of course, what we'd really like to do um, or what another approach we could take is actually to do molecular biology, and, and people have done this, um, starting to look at specific mutations, for example, in the promoter of estrogen receptor, um, to look at what uh, manipulating that um, promoter sequence does in, in cells, for example, for uh, gene expression. Uh, in birds, we've done pretty poorly so far with genome editing techniques that are taking off in the rest of the world, but that hopefully represents a, another way forward for the future. But if it were going to be, if that's really, if we really want to do, you know, 
fancy molecular methods like that to get at genotype phenotype um, <coughs> relationships. Uh, the system we probably want to do it in, to start at least, are on the other end of this continuum of weirdness, uh, that is the zebra finch. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about our work um, in that system <coughs> as well. Uh, so I've been saying that zebra finches are this model, but uh, some of you might not believe me because you've never heard of the zebra finch, and if you haven't heard of the zebra finch, how much of a model can it be? But there has actually been a lot of work on zebra finches. On the one hand, uh, behaviorally, uh, you know, behavioral ecology, uh, things like mate choice and how mate choice works. Um, but mechanistically, where, the, where the, a lot of interest in the zebra finch comes from is in studies of song learning. So songbirds learn their songs by copying their uh, parents. So they learn from a tutor early during development. And if they don't receive that um, tutoring, uh, they sing uh, aberrant songs. And so this behavior is actually very similar between uh, humans and uh, songbirds. But very few other critters uh, have this developmental song learning. And so in zebra finches, the behavior of song learning is very well characterized the auditory phase and the sensory motor uh, phase and when these start, as well as the neural substrates underlying song learning are uh, also well characterized. And so there's a lot of interest in using uh, zebra finch as a model to understand <coughs> song learning. Uh, unlike most people that study zebra finches, I've actually um, uh, looked at them in the field. And <laughs> um, and so actually one of my interests is in studying uh, the variation that exists in um, both uh, natural and wild populations of zebra finches. And I actually think um, aside from that song learning behavior, zebra finches have a lot of potential as a model system. Um, even, even when discussing this, this characteristic of song, um, song learning behavior, there hasn't been very much work to, do, to look at how different populations individuals might vary in this trait. Um, likewise, I think zebra finches uh, have a role to, to play in, in um, immunology. Birds are important vectors for a lot of diseases, um, include a lot of important diseases like uh, West Nile virus. And we don't know much about how the songbird immune system works relative to, um, well, an even more model system like uh, the chicken. And so, We've been trying to work particularly on um, those two axes. <coughs> um, but in order to do that, really, we've been also trying to understand genetic variation, natural genetic variation in zebra finches. And actually, uh, zebra finches come in two flavors, or uh, they're known as uh, or subspecies. One, uh, the Australian uh, zebra finch, which is actually the source population for the um, domesticated birds that most people use in their research, and the other, the Timor zebra finch from um, Southeast Asia. So, Australian zebra finches are found like all, all here, basically all of inland Australia. But there's a uh, uh, a second subspecies that colonized um, Southeast Asia, the eastern part of Indonesia and, and uh, Timor. And so I started studying these birds uh, as a postdoc, uh, really to get a handle on this genetic variation. And together with work we've done more recently, we've kind of put together um, a story about the history of zebra finches. And basically, um, from an ancestral population in um, Australia, about a million years ago, they colonized the islands. Uh, since that time, they've existed um, in isolation without gene flow. Uh, but these Timor birds are characterized by um, a pretty dramatic population bottleneck that greatly has reduced diversity in those birds relative to their wild Australian counterparts. As I said, the third sort of dimension is uh, domestication. And so the team, the, what we've been working on recently is actually uh, defining how the domesticated birds that everyone studies in the lab differs from their <coughs> wild counterparts. Um, and it's interesting because, uh, as with all other domestication stories that we know about, traits have been selected for um, both by humans and just by, um, by being propagated in the lab. And one of those traits is um, uh, body size. So body, these birds, these uh, domesticated birds, which are basically all of these guys, uh, these are the wild birds, uh, 
are like super zebra finches. They're like giant compared to their wild um, counterparts. And uh, we also expect that other traits like um, traits associated with mate choice have also been selected for in the, in the lab, right? So uh, an ideal zebra finch female is one that will reproduce readily in the lab and that's almost certainly been um, selected. So it'd be interesting to know how wild and domestic birds differ uh, genetically. We know something already from a microsatellite-based study from 2007 that has been that they, they show low um, levels of divergence in terms of FST and also a loss of um, diversity. But um, funnily enough, even though the, the, the FST values are, you know, the average is somewhere between 0.05 and 0.1, this study is typically used to uh, justify to say really there's no difference between the um, wild birds and the domesticated birds, so we don't have to worry about it in our studies. But as you know, even with an average FST that's relatively low, um, it's possible even likely that we'll have uh, high divergence in some parts of the genome and possibly interesting parts of the genome. So we'd like to know what that looks like. Uh, in zebra finches, this domestication has been relatively recently, so we're looking at um, uh, how uh, artificial selection has shaped this genome over recent timescales. And so this is a project that's being um, led by my PhD student, Allison, and um, with uh, collaborators Simon Griffith and Michael Brewer, who was a postdoc here. Um, we also have some other uh, Berkeley-associated folks that have been uh, helping us out, as well as uh, Soma. Thorfinn and Matteo, are you there? Are there? <laughs> I haven't met them yet, only emails. <laughs> uh, so the way, we, the way we looked at this is uh, we collected for another project um, high coverage genomes of uh, uh, wild birds, and we complemented this by uh, sequencing a set of medium coverage uh, domesticated birds. Medium coverage only because I didn't have enough money to do high coverage. And so to do this comparison, we downsampled these uh, uh, wild birds to about similar coverage, 8x, to make a fair comparison. Um, and, we, uh, and we're comparing these, these whole genomes to, to, to study this uh, domestication process. The uh, methods here, um, I'll just, just to uh, summarize briefly, maybe the most important thing is using this uh, ENGSD software, which is um, particularly important for these medium-ish coverage genomes to get uh, genotype likelihoods as opposed to um, to incorporate uncertainty in SNP calling. And sure enough, what we see in these domesticated birds uh, is a reduction in diversity, but uh, this doesn't look ideal. But uh, we also see, in particular, a loss of rare alleles. So you can see barely the curve of, to GMS D for the wild populations is, is uh, significantly more negative than it is for the wild birds. So in particular, we've, we've lost these rare alleles. Interestingly enough, we also, if we look at FST, we also see regions of the genome that are uh, highly divergent. Um, and so even though the average FST is, is relatively low, something around 0.04, we still see FST in subsets of the genome that approach one. Uh, in terms of the function of these genes, we're still just scratching the surface. Um, and this, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this in another uh, point, but making the mechanistic connections between uh, substitutions uh, in these genes, like uh, prolactin, for example, are challenging. Because this the SNP in prolactin, yeah, I looked at prolactin, I was like, yes. This is a gene that has to do with growth, parental care. But sure enough, the, the SNP is like 100 kb away. And we don't know anything about, really, gene regulation, the details of enhancers in songbirds. And so we have a lot of work um, in this system to understand better gene regulatory sequences and gene regulation before we can really closely tie any of these SNPs that are intergenic with what they're actually doing um, in the genome. So I, I preface this by saying what, what, what we really want to get at in zebra finches also, and what we need to get at besides documenting genetic variation, is also um, phenotyp, phenotypic variation. And, and I think there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff here, too. So one of the things uh, we've observed is that Australian birds, um, domesticated versions of the Australian um, subspecies, show a lot more individual variability 
in their song. So these are sort of summary plots of uh, three individuals per subspecies and something like 200 songs of each um, individual summarized. So it's plotted as frequency modulation against duration. And each of these blobs represents kind of rep re repetitions of a particular syllable. So the, the, the salient thing should be that these three plots look different from each other. Uh, and these three plots look relatively similar to each other. And so this is certainly preliminary data. But this is one of the things we're working on describing um, how song variability itself varies among populations. But more importantly, the mechanisms underlying that difference in song variability. So to get at that, we're doing, uh, Allison is doing cross-fostering experiments, for example, where she's taking these Australian and Timor birds um, and uh, cross-fostering them to a Bengalese finch, really to ask the question, um, do these different birds differ in their ability to copy a template song? If they do, well, then that's kind of interesting. And then we can do the next experiments, which would be to cross them and see if hybrids um, are, say, intermediate in such a tree. Uh, a second suite of characteristics we've been looking at in zebra finches is, uh, are immune-related. This is uh, looking at susceptibility to experimental West Nile virus infections. Um, here we're actually a little bit further along. We've, we've pretty well characterized the immune response of uh, zebra finches to, to West Nile virus. And they, they can broadly be described as moderately susceptible, which means that they carry enough virus that they could then transmit it to a mosquito vector. Um, and so that's sort of a nice thing if you want to have a model for uh, a songbird uh, host of West Nile virus. Um, the second thing we can show, though, is that the Timor birds and the Australian birds actually differ in their susceptibility. So the Timor birds carry a higher uh, viral load and they die at a higher rate um, following infection. Australian birds generally survive, Timor birds generally survive, but we've had a small number of deaths um, among those birds that get uh, infected. So here we actually have a difference between the two subspecies in their susceptibility to this um, immune challenge. We've been looking at this also from a gene expression perspective. Uh, another PhD student, um, Dan, measuring uh, gene expression um, during that same time course, uh, really comparing controls with day two and day four post-infection. <coughs> this is a list of genes that are differentially expressed between day four, which are these last three blobs, and control, which are these first three blobs. And really all we want to know here is there's been all this work on mammals to understand um, their immune system, and particularly how they respond to West Nile virus. But you know, what about songbirds as the natural um, reservoir host? How, how similar and different are mammalian um, and avian immune responses? And actually, what we find, happily enough, is, is quite broad parallels between how these two uh, di divergent uh, immune systems respond. One of the genes I've highlighted is DDX5. I can show the plot another way that is easier to see and possibly more convincing that this gene is uh, upregulated after infection. And this is a cool gene because this is one of the key receptors that binds, um, that binds the uh, vir viral particles. And it's at the head, it's at the top of this uh, RIG1 pathway. So these are the receptors, RIG1 and MDA5. And both of those are strongly upregulated four days after infection, as well as we see reg regulation of some of the downstream um, um, players in this pathway as well. So hopefully, you know, you're believing that there's some interesting um, phenotypes to play with here. Uh, if we back out a bit further, I suspect, so these are the closest relatives of the zebra finch, so the other, other Australian astrilded finches, I think um, there'll be more interesting phenotypes to look at. Mm -hmm. If we back out really an, uh, <coughs> another notch further, then we get to um, one of my favorite traits um, is this uh, origin of brood parasitism that I alluded to early on. So the zebra finch is part of this clade called the Astrildid finches, and their, their sister clade is uh, a group of about 20 species that are all brood parasitic. And this part is just going to be short and sweet to tell you a little bit about uh, what we're doing in, in that system. And really, to, to start with, it has to do with this song learning thing that I told you about. And really, I'm only going to tell you. <laughs> The question, because we don't actually have any answers at all yet. Um, 
So zebra finches learn their song from their parents. Uh, these brood parasitic birds are songbirds that should be learning from their parents, but are actually not learning from their parents because they're brood parasitic. So these birds are being raised by a foster species, yet they somehow have to figure learn their own conspecific song at some point. How do they do that without exposure to their um, parents? That is the question. Um, one hypothesis might be that this timeline that I described for zebra finch is shifted such that they learn their songs later in life when somehow they're consorting, consorting with a conspecifics. Uh, another hypothesis that was raised by my collaborator is that they have to be exposed to an innate sort of trigger, a password, uh, that in turn triggers their learning of other conspecific cues. And so we're trying to test this um, hypothesis using um, brood parasitic songbirds, the ones that I showed you, as well as uh, cowbirds in North America. Brood parasites are amazingly cool, and we use them also a lot in outreach to te teach about host parasite coevolution. So this is a parasitic bird and its host, and this is showing the evolution of mimicry. Um, I mention this because I want to highlight the fact that we're doing some. Um, we one of the weird things about living in <laughs> eastern North Carolina is that there happens to be one of the great bird zoos of the world located just like 45 minutes from my university. And so we're actually breeding these birds at this place, Sylvan Heights Bird Park. They get about 50,000 visitors a year, even though there's like 200 people that live in the whole town. Um, <laughs> uh, so we have an exhibit with brood parasitic birds and their hosts. Um, and we're expanding it dramatically with uh, this, this, this part is NSF funded. And um, this is hopefully going to result in some cool outreach. Uh, Brood parasitisms evolved seven times independently in birds, so there's a lot of cool evolutionary biology to do there, and we're hoping to do it and use it as a vehicle for outreach. So hopefully I've convinced you that combining these model systems and really weird birds is useful. Uh, probably the, uh, my newest addition to the weird bird repertoire uh, are mannequins. Um, they're famous for their courtship displays, uh, neotropical birds, and so we're trying to understand using this um, sort of the influence as a sexual selection on the genome. Really trying to uh, take advantage of long-term field sites that people have had. There's really detailed studies of field-based studies of sexual selection. Um, really trying to tie that together with some of the genomic biology that we're doing. But I, that is not why I meant put up this slide. I put up this slide specifically because one of the other things we're trying to do is uh, do detailed work to understand um, uh, gene structures in birds. So we're really trying to get people together to manually annotate genes and genomes uh, in these birds. One of the, you know, I, I, hopefully I've highlighted throughout that there are still challenges in birds in doing genomics, and namely that we don't know too much beyond the sort of default annotations that we get from NCBI. And so I think one of the things we're trying to do here is, is really spend some time trying to understand bird genomes. And this is part of the NSF-funded research coordination network. And I mention it because we're always looking for people to help with this challenge of annotating genomes. I think if we're going to really do genomics in wild, weird creatures, and even normal creatures like zebra finches, we're going to need to put some time and effort into understanding their genomes. And so with that, I will thank you, and I'll take any questions. All right, I think you can go for it. Yeah, so I kind of have two kind of interrelated questions that uh, pertain to the uh, the heterospecific mating between uh -huh. the two morphologies of the four gendered white throated sparrow. Um, and so I noticed that on the inverted region, you identified some perhaps candidate genes and some of them related to hormones. And I was wondering what you thought was the contribution of uh, these different um, hormone titers in manipulating the behaviors and uh, specific the aggressiveness of the birds and how that actually played into one preferring the other type, because I think that what I got from the first part of your talk, that it kind of paired between a really dominant bird and a kind of more submissive bird between the two. Yeah, well, I guess I would say that 
the, the one pairing is sort of among the extremes, uh -huh. the, the white morph male and the tan morph female. The other pairing is not so discreetly, not so obviously dominant. I mean, I guess it's true that both, uh, that there is a pairing of a dom in both directions, a pairing of a more dominant and a less, less dominant. I don't, I guess I don't know uh, how the hormones per se relate to mate choice. That isn't really how I've thought about it, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting way to think about it. I, I've thought about, I thought about the mate choice as more being like a preference trait kind of thing where you have a, you have a, you have a, it happened to be that the preference for say tan stripe versus white stripe is encoded, um, you know, unlike what you think about in speciation where you have the, your preference and trait linked uh, for the same preference that leads to assortative mating, you have opposite sort of preference and trait linked. Um, but I, I don't, haven't, I guess I haven't ever been able to really link um, like what is the mechanism by which uh, those preferences are actually encoded? Is it hormones or is it something in the opsin type yeah, so sensory system? Kind of the question that I was getting at is yeah. uh, have you looked or has it been on kind of your research agenda to incorporate uh, manipulations of the hormone levels, especially those hormones that are relative are relevant to this inverted region on the corporate chromosome? Uh, yeah, so there have been some <laughs> hormone manipulations done and you can I, but I don't think they've been done in the context of mate choice. Yeah, I think that's, 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 that's an interesting, that's yeah. cool. I don't, I've never thought about that. That's, okay. Um, if, if mate choice changes with hormone, I think that's okay. Uh, there was a, an IB seminar last week, um, uh, and the speaker was talking about how vagal neural crest cells um, form the vagus nerve as well as the enteric nerve system. And it's interesting that you noted the difference between uh, domesticated finches and wild finches, and that those differences uh, were shown in both their song as well as in their enteric, uh, in a gene involved in their enteric nervous system. So I'm wondering, um, because both of those differences were, were obvious in, in your study, um, I'm wondering if there's any differences in developmental time of the vagal neural crest cells in the wild populations versus the domesticated populations. Yeah, two, th two things, I guess. We definitely don't know that, the, those differences <laughs> between that. But the second thing is with the genes. I didn't really point this out well. So, you know, what we use there is a, we use a fairly strict p-value cutoff. And those, there was literally, at that threshold, there's like nine genes, nine SNPs that show differences in allele frequency, significant differences in allele frequency between the two. Population. So those list of genes is just a, the short list of genes at a very strict p-value cutoff. And so those could be both due to, at this point, those could be just random chance. It's not like I picked those genes because of uh, enrichment of gene ontology, which is something that you see a lot of times, or any other sort of more like cohesive signal. That's just a list of genes, and we need to, what we need to do is figure out whether those SNPs are doing something interesting. Uh, but we don't know that yet. For that, the, a sort of more ancient origin of that 2M chromosome, have you guys thought about trying to put it back into Harris Sparrow and see <laughs> what happens? This came up, I, so recently I gave a uh, slightly modified version of this talk in my department where we have some people who are doing a lot of, uh, uh, oh, well, are you thinking about like by crossing or by, mm, yeah, I guess, crossing. Uh, my, I'm kind of one track mind on genome editing. These days. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I don't know how easy that would be to do. Uh, but it's a, so we can cross birds, and I have been crossing zebra finches and their, their ilk in the lab, but I don't know how easy it is to, to breed these birds. You can keep these birds in the lab, but I don't know how easy it is to breed them and to get them to uh, get them, even get them to mate normally, let alone hybridize uh, in the lab. But yeah, um, if taking that whole chunk and sticking it in a Harrow Sparrow. I want a second Rory's suggestion. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Sparrow. But um, <clears throat> you mentioned that 2M you thought came from hybridization with yeah. an extinct species. Mm -hmm. So an alternative, I guess, is that it originated a long time ago and was lost in those other lineages. Right. Uh, why do you think that it came from hybridization? Yeah, so this is the indirect, definitely indirect uh, sort of uh, uh, evidence. But I think because the, or the, the 
origin of the uh, inversion is relatively old, and our signature of degradation is so subtle that I, I guess we we were we were thinking that the the signature of degradation would be stronger if it had been polymorphic like this since that origin at the base of the at the base of that radiation. It's tricky though because it. There is some recombination, right? We do occasionally get these 2M, 2M homozygotes that might also mitigate this degeneration signal. So basically, you know, our signal is we have this enrichment of non-synonymous polymorphism, but we don't have, a, uh, among fixed differences, we actually don't see an enrichment of non-synonymous um, fixed differences. So that signature of de degeneration is mild, and so that's what we're thinking. But I, we can't rule out the alternative, but I don't know if you have how old is it? So that's a good question. So I, I don't know that we've actually put it on a, it's probably, it'd probably be 20 million years, something like that, something like that. So maybe it's a, just a follow up question. So there's no remnants of the genomic 2M so, okay, in so that, any of the genomes that are outside of these not that we know about, but that, no, that's a good point as well. So one thing that we would need to do is actually, we haven't done population sampling in quite the same way for all the species. So another thing that could be, it could be, it could be there somewhere, but at, at the at small population size samples, we've done karyotypes of these different species. We don't see it. It hasn't been described. But, you know, maybe it's there in some funny population of these birds somewhere. Um, but and that would be another thing to do also is to and that's one of the things we're interested in is increasing our sampling of some of these other species. I have one more question. So it looked like FST wasn't equivalently high all across that. Yeah. So that the end, the end it goes yeah. down. What, what's that about? Yeah. So I think I think that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know that I I um, I think there's first of all. I think there's been um, nested inversions within within the chromosome that we have not quite nailed down yet, and so I think that probably explains it. And that that lower FST part uh, probably had uh, more recent recombination than the other part, but that's we haven't I haven't got that all nailed down yet. Is there a way to fish out that same inversion region from other species? Because I mean, I'm thinking of some of these other pseudogenes where. There's evidence that it's not just like one inversion event, right? It's something that's pieces of it are moved around multiple times. And you may find evidence of smaller inversions in other taxa that, you know, have changed over time if you had to go fishing among some of these other genomes. So, so that this big block represents some combination of other inversions yeah. that... That wasn't all just one big event, that it's... It's happened to different degrees, and it yeah. just coalesced to the extent that it's this big block now. You know, it's just been a. I mean, that's kind of what the rough system sort of. Did. Well, so I think certainly there's been more than one inversion, even within this region. But I, I'm, I'm kind of struggling to figure out how that would, how that would work. I mean, I don't know. I have to think about that. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's uh, thank Chris again.